outreach at Kilmon today. In this conference, we're going to be raising money for the Wounded Warrior Project. This is a non-profit organization that raises money for veterans and current military members. Um, I would like to take a second to thank someone who helped organize everything here today. And we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her. Thank you to Ms. Cardellis for all the work that she's done. <laughs> our Director General, Nathan Ma. Thank you and good luck. Good evening, delegates. It is my absolute honor to be serving as your Director General for this conference. Now, before I go any further, I would like you all to give a massive round of applause to your sponsors and everyone who's worked so hard to staff and run this committee. The last few months, We've worked tirelessly to make this dream become a reality. But rather than just go into the typical deal that you might hear at any average conference about how, you know, uh, give accounts about our arguments or late night managements that we had to do, I will instead let the quality of the conference show through the fruits of our efforts. As an alumnus of Kilmer Middle School, I have this club to thank for introducing me to the program and giving me something that, that would last with me for a long time, and I can only hope that this gives it to you too. Whether you're engaging in fruitful debate on border security and doing a better job than our current government is on the issue of immigration or trying to fix the 2008 financial crisis, we hope you all engage in some fruitful debate. With that in mind, I would like to now introduce the Secretary General, my brother in arms, and who, without whom this conference would absolutely not have been possible, Alex Kim. Uh, over the past five months, my secretary, uh, secretariat and I have been working tirelessly to organize this conference. Um, I'm not going to devote into the details too much, but currently I'm a junior, and if I were to tell you everything that I learned from Model UN, uh, we'd be here for a very long time. But there's one thing I hope you all remember, not only until tomorrow, not only until next year, but through all, uh, throughout all of your Model UN career. And it's probably something that you've all heard before, too. Uh, awards don't matter. Uh, why do I say this? That question can easily be summarized by one story. It's not like one of those super long stories that adults tell you. Um, so in April 2017, I attended Cornell Model UN Conference. It was a four-day conference at, as you can probably guess, Cornell University. I was in spec with uh, 125 delegations. Um, I did fairly well, at least I thought so. Um, but I learned some very valuable lessons. Um, sorry, I can't find my place. Uh, as I sat down in the conference hall waiting for the awards to be presented, I was really hopeful for the gathering. Uh, that's all I care about, that one gavel, um, the elusive gavel. But as soon as the chair stepped up the podium, I felt super uneasy. Um, for all those are, uh, those are familiar, the chair says before announcing verbal commendation, that all those uh, with verbal commendation please stand. Um, well, I got verbal commendation, and I was so upset that I didn't stand. Um, I didn't want to. Uh, but then I realized that it wasn't necessarily the, the gavel that was important to me, but the lessons that I learned that day. Um, these ambitions were just a piece of wood uh, blinding me to the real things that mattered, the friends that I made and the experiences that I had. Um, to be completely honest, it's hard. It's hard to open your eyes to the, to the world that's beyond the gavel because it's an affirmation of our skills. We can go up to someone, we can prove to someone, we can say, oh, I have a gavel, and that makes me good at model human. But when you go past that, uh, then you can see the true val value of model human. Uh, for all of, you, uh, all of you who want to one day go into international affairs, are you ready to be inspired by your peers and work towards something? Uh, it's fine to want a gavel, it's fine to work towards a gavel, but if you want to do something important and valuable to society, you have to be able to move past the gavel and to learn those experiences and really apply those in a practical setting. Now, with that in mind, please allow me to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Russell Wilson. Mr. Wilson is a pioneer in the field of international affairs. He's a principal foreign policy advisor to the House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Europe and the Middle East from 1988 to 1993. He then became the staff director of the Committee on Asia and the Pacific. He, was, he served on the first diplomatic team to North Korea, and then later he went to Cuba to meet uh, and negotiate with Fidel Castro in 1995. So please give a warm welcome to Mr. Russell Wilson. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, just to let you all know, Alex and I know each other because I was his fencing coach, actually. That's how we first met. <laughs> Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Most of you were probably here because you either have an interest in international relations or your parents convinced you that doing this activity would look really good on your record. 
both of those are legitimate reasons to be here. Um, so what are international relations? International relations can, can go from everything between countries deciding what the rules are for one person to visit another country as uh, a guest or a visitor or a tourist to discussing what the root problems are between uh, countries involved in conflicts to avoid war. So international relations is a very, very, very broad field. And uh, when Alex and I were talking about what I would discuss with you all today, he suggested that I talk to you about what got me into the field of international relations. Because I'm sure most of you didn't wake up this morning and say, I think I'm going to be a diplomat or I think I'm going to be a foreign policy advisor. When I was in eighth grade, and I also taught eighth grade, in fact, for a year when I graduated from undergrad, the last thing, <clears throat> the last thing in my mind when I was your age was, I think I'm going to become a specialist in foreign policy. I think I'm going to advise politicians and leaders about relations between countries. When I was your age, my parents wanted me to become a doctor. I'm sure you probably, uh, I'm sure you probably heard some chatter like that around your dinner table. You've got to be a doctor, you've got to be a lawyer, maybe an engineer. Very few parents when you're in eighth grade say, hey, I've got a really good idea. You should become a foreign policy advisor. So I get into high school and I decide, okay, I'm going to go pre med, but I joined the history club at my school and I got really active in that became president of the student government, and that was really fun, and I was still getting pressure from home. That's really nice, but <laughs> that white coat's waiting for you when you graduate from uh, medical school. So I kept thinking, I'm going to go into medicine. I'm going to go into medicine. It's a great field. You can make a lot of money. You can help people. Terrific field. And if that's what you want to do, I truly encourage you. Um, but I wound up then, so okay, so I'm in high school, and one of the things that my high school had was, as I said, this history club where we used to invite different foreign students from the local college to come and meet with us and talk about their culture and what their country was like. This was really interesting to me, all these different, all these different cultures, all these different countries. And then when I was 16, my school had a trip to Spain for a week. So I went on that trip and that was really interesting to me. It was fascinating. I was taking Spanish language at the time, and I, I uh, Spanish language all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's fabulous. Um, and then after that, I wound up liking it so much that I kept going back to uh, Spain. Every, every summer, my school then had a uh, summer program where for six weeks we could study intensely uh, both the foreign, uh, foreign language, both Spanish language, and the history and culture of Spain. I thought that was great. So then when it came time to um, apply to colleges, I also had something else going on. Turned out I was a pretty good fencer. How many of you are familiar with sword fighting, fencing? Well, I was a pretty good sword fighter. And my coach was the best fencing coach, one of the best fencing coaches in the world at the time. So. I was doing pretty well. I was, by junior year, I was ranked second in the country in juniors, and later on I became a national champion. But I wanted to go to school where I'd be close to my coach, and he was in New York City, and the best school in New York City was Columbia. So back in those days, college, college entrances were a lot easier than it is for you all. I don't envy any of you today applying to colleges. Back in my day, I was recruited as an athlete, which I can tell you provides a substantial advantage. A substantial advantage over anything else, over legacy. That means it's an advantage over if your parents went to that school. It's an advantage over whether or not your parent goes to that school and even gives money. It's an advantage over any other kind of preference that you can have. So if there's a, if you're really good in a particular sport or really interested, I would really encourage you not to do it for college, but do it because you enjoy it with the added benefit that later on is going to probably benefit you. So I did something you really can't do today. So I applied to Columbia early decision, and I didn't even think about any other schools. I figured if I got rejected or deferred, I would then think about applying to other places. But luckily, I got accepted. 
So my college ad admissions experience was a lot less stressful than it is today, trust me. I'm glad I'm not applying today because I don't know if I would get into Columbia today. It's getting so crazy as far as the percentages that are accepted. But I decided I wanted to be near my coach and I wanted to go to Columbia. So when I was an uh, undergrad, as we call it, when you're in your first four years of college going for your bachelor's degree, again, my parents kept pressing me on the pre-med thing. But there was a little problem. I kept delaying chemistry, which is the first class you've got to take for pre-med. The other thing is, and I'm not, again, I'm not trying to decide you from becoming doctors, to uh, deter you from becoming doctors if you want to do that, but at midnight, with, between midnight and 3 a.m., we always knew that there was a chemistry exam going off because somebody would hit the fire alarm and everyone would have to leave. So you'd go from your underwear to getting out of the building as quickly as you could, and I'm like, this is, this is kind of miserable. I don't really know if I want to be a part of this. I like seeing other people do well, not trying to put them down. Then you hear stories about people messing with other people's lab experiment, uh, experiments in biology, and I decided, you know, I think I'm going to keep delaying that chemistry class. Well, imagine things happen when you're an undergrad and you keep delaying chemistry. It becomes too late to go for med. So you've got to go to plan B. So what's plan B? Plan B, I told my parents, okay, I want to go to grad school, and then I'll go to law school after that. So they had a week of mourning on my behalf. They would have a, uh, there would be a mourning ceremony. People would be grieving my lack of uh, ability to eventually wear a white jacket for about a week, and then my parents accepted the fact that it was really going to eventually be my decision what I decided to do, so they were kind of okay with it. So here I am in Columbia, didn't, didn't take chemistry, and I learned about a subject called political science. I never even knew that existed when I was in high school. You could actually study political science, but the good thing about the science part is you didn't have to take calculus. So I kind of liked that. I, there's a major for me where I didn't have to take anything beyond the math that I took in high school, and I'm like, hmm, this could have my name on it. So the advantage that I had at Columbia at that time was there was a very famous professor who had been President Carter's National Security Advisor. His name was uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. He died last year. And he taught this class at Columbia with 250 students, and only five students got A minuses. So I figured, OK, I've been doing pretty well so far. I'm going to take this class. And my faculty advisor, the late Roger Hilsman, who was another giant in international relations, said, Russ, why don't you take it pass-fail? There are a lot of really miserable grades that come out of this class. He's a really tough grader. I said, Professor, I'm going to go for it. I'm really enjoying this. And if I'm not cut out for this, that's fine. And I took uh, Professor Brzezinski's class. And he had a choice of either doing a paper where he created a crisis that you had to propose solutions to after he taught us how that would be done at the White House if you were working on the National Security Council where you can take a final exam. So some, one student raised their hand and they said, well, what should I do, professor? And the professor said, it's hard to fail a paper. Very good advice. So I decided to not take the final exam and do the paper. So I took the paper and I was one of the lucky five people that got A minuses. Now, what came along with that was an unsolicited letter of recommendation from Professor Brzezinski. That was really good because that helped me get my first job. So while I was waiting for my security clearances to go through, that's where the government investigates your background, I was teaching students your age at a school called Pengree. It's a private school in New Jersey. I was teaching eighth and ninth graders. And um, it turned out that there was an opening uh, for an internship at Capitol Hill on the summer in the office of my former congressman, Benjamin Gilman, the late Benjamin Gilman from New York. Now, Congressman Gilman was the ranking minority member, at that time Republicans were in the minority, ranking minority member on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, subcommittee on Europe and the Middle East. So it turned out that I interviewed with him, and he said, do you like to write? I figured the right answer is yes, so I said yes. And he offered me to work on uh, the committee for that summer, 
Um, and see what it would be like to work as a professional staff member, a very junior professional staff member, working for the person who was the one foreign policy advisor for the Republicans on Europe and Middle East. Now, at that point, I didn't have any particularly defined political ideology, and the world was very different then. Democrats and Republicans on foreign policy issues were much more in agreement about certain things than they are today. So I got there, and I, I did a pretty good job, and I had a huge advantage. The congressman didn't know very many people. So when the guy I was working for on the committee left, I was one of the only guys he actually knew. So I was 23 years old, and I was very, very lucky, and he offered me to take the guy who I was working for his job, and I became the only foreign policy advisor on that Europe and Middle East subcommittee working on the minority side during that time. I was pinching myself, because this was an amazing, amazing opportunity. I had originally planned on perhaps going to Notre Dame, where I was offered a PhD to coach the fencing team, they pay for it. And he convinced me to stick around here, because that's the job that I'd want if I had the PhD, and then go to grad school at Georgetown. So I did that. Then after grad school, I decided to get a law degree just for the heck of it. And I, I did that in America, and then wound up teaching law for a number of years. So I want to tell you all that there are a number of things that I would suggest to you if you want to get into this field, or even if you don't. No matter what it is you decide to do, try to find something you love and be passionate about. That's the most important thing. The other thing is, as early on as possible, and 7th and 8th grade is a really good time to do this, calibrate your moral compass and always try to do the right thing. If you always try to do the right thing, and you always work as hard as you possibly can at whatever job you're doing, you'll never have to worry about having another job. While I was in that job, I was really young when I was 27. After about five years in that job, I was offered the opportunity to become staff director of the Asia Subcommittee. So there I got to be involved with things like traveling to North Korea and getting involved in the North Korean nuclear negotiations, meeting with the current leader of North Korea's grandfather. So this to me was really exciting. And I knew that the most important thing no matter what, again, and that proved it, was to always try to do the best you can at whatever you're doing. Now, the only last thing I would suggest for you all that's really, really important is, and you're going to hear this from your parents, from your teachers, from everybody else, stay away from getting into trouble with things like drugs, because stuff like that disqualifies you from this profession. Because when they do a background investigation, they go very, very deep and they ask people you know and then they ask people who know the people that you know whether or not you've ever been involved in using alcohol excessively or using drugs and that's disqualifying. So you don't want to do something in high school or college that's going to be disqualifying for an entire whole category of really interesting career choices that could be, that could be um, something you might like to do. So I don't really have anything to add beyond that, except to tell you that I had a very rich experience doing this kind of work. When I was your age again, I had no idea that this kind of work was even out there. So be open-minded about these things, experience different courses, try to enjoy different cultural experiences that you have. And if you enjoy traveling, if you enjoy dealing with people, if you enjoy foreign languages, this could very well be a career field that might be good for you. So I want to wish you all the very, very best of luck and if there's ever anything I can do for you to help you in any way, you can contact Alex Kim, and I'll be happy to do that uh, through Alex. Thank you very much, and best of luck at this conference, and always. Thank you.